Putin. His regime stands accused of poisoning his main political rival in Russia, Alexei Navalny, with the deadly nerve agent Novichok. The poisoning suggests kind of a measure of desperation that the regime in Russia has run out of arguments and now has to resort to sheer violence. But events in neighboring Belarus show violence alone isn't always enough to maintain control. Protesters there have braved state-sponsored terror to demand that dictator Alexander Lukashenko steps down. And the Kremlin is watching, as thousands of miles away in far eastern Russia, protesters have also been on the street for weeks. They say they stand with Belarus. So should Putin be worried? Putin's legitimacy is waning, and this is extraordinary events to watch. We're seeing history in the making here. On August 9th, Alexander Lukashenko, the longest-serving autocrat in Europe, declared a landslide election victory in Belarus. He came to power in 1994, and since then, not one of his elections has been free or fair. But this time, the people refused to accept the rigged result. It sparked the largest popular protest in Belarus's history. One of the leaders of the opposition, Maria Kolesnikova, was on the streets in the capital, Minsk. But Lukashenko's use of violence has intensified. Ten days after we interviewed Maria Kolesnikova, she was abducted by Mr. Lukashenko's plain-clothed security goons. She's now in prison. Only two months ago, nothing suggested this, this was coming. Lukashenko has rigged elections for years. He had everything under control. And it's like with metal, you know, metal develops a fatigue. But you don't know when it's going to break. The speed and scale of the revolt has rattled Putin. While neighboring Russia and Belarus are different in many ways, their two leaders have some similarities. Both Putin and Lukashenko pledged to restore stability after the Soviet collapse, and both changed the constitution so they can effectively stay in power forever. And both rely on the threat, or use, of violence to maintain control. <laughs> Belarus is important because it is a template uh, for, in a way, for what's been happening in Russia and what might come uh, in Russia. If even somebody like Lukashenko can be so brittle and changes can be so unexpected, then that changes your calculation about how long Putin can actually stay in power himself. Discontent has been building up for years in Belarus. The state-run economy had stalled, and Lukashenko's promises to restore Soviet-style order and pride were increasingly meaningless to the new generation. Then COVID-19 struck. Lukashenko refused to impose lockdowns, and even said the virus did not exist. This mobilized civil society to step in where their leader had failed. People started crowdfunding, uh, buying protective uh, equipment for doctors, uh, delivering that protective equipment, informing people about what's happening. They took over the function of the state. The energy of civic activism then flowed and morphed into political activism. This popular revolution has become a national awakening after years of Soviet-style rule. It was led by three women, headed by Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. She only stood because her husband, a political vlogger who wanted to run for the presidency, had been jailed. Are you confident that the uprising will win? I believe in my people, in people of Belarus. As the protest spread, she was threatened and fled to Lithuania. Maria Kolesnikova, was the last member of the original opposition left in Belarus until she disappeared.
While protest raged in Belarus, thousands of miles away in Habarovsk, a city in Russia's far east, another popular movement has been gaining ground. Demonstrators have been on the streets since July, protesting against the arrest of a popular local governor who was elected against the Kremlin's wishes. When the revolution in, in Belarus had started, suddenly the slogans in Khabarovsk are long live Belarus. There's that connection that should be a moment of worry for the Kremlin. With anti-government protests in both Russia's Far East and Minsk, the Putin regime took decisive action. On August 20th, opposition leader Alexei Navalny was poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok, which was allegedly found on a water bottle in his hotel room. This has provoked international condemnation. The mystery about what made a Russian opposition leader critically ill has he been solved. It has unequivocal German proof that Russian opposition leader Alexei leader Navalny was poisoned the Novichok, by a The highly potent radio. Soviet nerve agent was used against him. While Navalny himself is banned from standing for office, he had been encouraging his supporters to vote tactically in forthcoming local elections. Но нам нужно подняться и снова пойти в бой, ведь до тех пор, пока мы не победим, наша страна обречена медленно деградировать. And while he had been imprisoned and attacked many times before, there had never been a direct attempt on his life like this. Having a leader who will be seen as legitimate by protesters and possibly by parts of the elite is now too risky. And so this is the step that Putin's regime has taken to, to take him out of the picture. Uh, and then something went wrong. When Mr. Navalny was taken ill on a flight over Siberia, the pilot made an emergency landing. Paramedics were then able to reach him, identify he had been poisoned and administer an antidote. By the time he reached hospital, security services and state media tried to take control of the story and claimed he might simply have fainted due to hunger. But it was too late. His life had been saved and the truth was out. The human response to this situation could not have been predicted or planned. Because contrary to what Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko think, humans do have their own free will. This shows you actually Putin doesn't control everything. Mr. Navalny's candidates won symbolic victories in the local elections. He is now recovering in Germany. And while the actions of a pilot or paramedic in Siberia may seem far removed from the rallying cry of protesters in Belarus, the actions of both show that Putin and Lukashenko are not all-powerful. When people have individual will, as they do, um, the regimes don't know how to deal with that. They only stay in power for as long as they maintain legitimacy. Once they've lost that, things start happening. And this is what we're seeing now. This, this is why this is a really historic moment. Putin cannot be beaten through the ballot box and his main opposition is out of the picture, for now at least. But if Lukashenko falls, it will send a signal to people in Russia that dictatorial rulers can be beaten. Putin has now promised Lukashenko $1.5 billion to help prop up the regime. And while it is impossible to predict exactly when or how Lukashenko will fall, the European Parliament says his presidency should not be recognized from November. This summer's events have shown Putin is unsettled and scared, which makes what happens next increasingly unpredictable and dangerous. I'm Arkady Ostrovsky and I'm the Russia editor at The Economist. If you'd like to know more about events in Belarus or the poisoning of Alexei Navalny or the protests in Khabarovsk,